Hi, my name's Anna MacArthur, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Big Food Workshop. The Foundation team have been working over the last 10 years to accelerate the transition to a circular economy which is regenerative by design. And we passionately believe that the food system itself holds great opportunity and potential in this shift to solve some of the greatest global challenges. That's exactly why we created the Food Initiative, working with chefs, farmers, food companies, agricultural companies, and numerous other organizations across the world to turn this vision into a reality. The current COVID-19 crisis has shown us we have a greater need than ever to create a distributed, diverse, and regenerative system. And we hope you'll learn a lot during this workshop. And by the end, you'll see how you can play a role in that yourself. So thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you have a fantastic few days. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Nick Jeffries from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And I hope you feel as inspired as I do by those words from Ellen, our founder, that officially opened the Big Food Workshop. And hi everyone, my name is Emma Chow, also with the Foundation. And it was so great to be here co-hosting this opening session of our three-day Big Food Workshop. Back in 2005, Ellen inspired millions around the world by breaking the record for sailing around the world on her own. A huge and technical achievement, but not as big as the next challenge she set herself, changing the global economy, including the biggest sector of all, the food and agriculture system. Now, just as Ellen's uh, solo sailing record relied on a huge support team, so this next challenge relies on a huge and ever-expanding network of individuals and organisations around the world who see the logic, the urgency, and also the opportunities in making the change. And now, to echo Ellen's words, as we recover from the, contemplate our recovery from the COVID uh, crisis, and of course, the even bigger climate crisis, the need to redirect our economy onto a positive trajectory is even more important now than it ever was. Absolutely, Nick. And this pandemic has forced us to do things differently, including the way that we engage with you, our global network and audience. And just a few months ago, we'd imagined that today we'd be hosting a one-day workshop in person at a venue in London. But of course, things quickly changed in ways that no one could have ever really predicted. But one of the silver linings of all of this is that we've moved into this digital format. And it means that we get to come together in a much bigger global virtual community with all of you around the world. That's right, by moving online, we've been able to expand our live audience from about 150 to, well, thousands. And we're so stoked that so many of you have shown an interest in our work and spare time uh, to tune in today from all corners of the world. And I'd just like to remind you uh, that this workshop is intended to be interactive. So please lean in and contribute when you feel. Right now, it would be great if you could tell us who you are, where you're from, you know, what, what organisation you're from and whereabouts in the world you are. And as we proceed, if you have any questions or comments, then please feel free to share with us. Now, in case this is your first time engaging with the Foundation and with Circular Economy, perhaps, let's first set a bit of context starting with who we are, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Well, we're a global charity, nearly 10 years old, dedicated to our mission of accelerating the transition to a circular economy. We're working to shift from today's extractive, damaging, linear system to one that's regenerative and restorative by, by design. One that allows people, nature, and the economy to thrive long-term. We call this the circular economy. So Nick, tell us, what exactly is the circular economy? Well, I think a good starting point for introducing the circular economy is to consider where we are at the moment. Uh, the current dominant economic model, what we call the linear economy. And the linear economy, we uh, extract stuff, take resources out of the ground, we make products that only last, often only last for a short amount of time, and then we throw them away. It's a classic take, make, waste economy. Now some of the key features of this linear economy are that it creates a huge amount of material waste across all sectors, uh, electronics, construction, fashion, plastic, and of course food, the mother of all economic sectors. 
Each year, our cities produce hundreds of millions of tonnes of organic waste, a lot of which is perfectly edible food. And this ends up festering on landfills and, uh, and then and generating sh huge volumes of uh, uh, damaging carbon emissions. Now, all of these resources are essentially lost from the economy. So we have to extract more and burn more energy to replace them. This continual extraction of resources leads to another characteristic of the linear economy. It's hugely degrading to nature and harmful to human health. What does this look like when we apply it to the food system? Well, last year we published a report that set out in detail the impacts of the linear economy on the food system. We calculated that for every dollar we spend on food, there are equivalent of two dollars of negative environmental and health impacts. Now these impacts, half of these impacts, are what we call consumption impacts. Things like uh, obesity, malnutrition, uh, diseases associated with diet. But the other half are uh, impacts that arise from the way we produce food and the way we manage waste and byproducts. And they include things like air and water pollution, uh, antimicrobial resistance and health impact to farmers. If we add up all these impacts, it totals about 12 12 trillion dollars worth. Clearly this is not a healthy situation, not for the economy, not for people, not for the environment. There must be another path. That's right, Nick. It's clear that we can't just try to tweak and optimize the incredibly linear, damaging current system. We actually need to redesign the system. And circular economy gives us three principles. Designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use, and regenerating natural systems. These are the principles of circular economy which underpin all of our work at the foundation. And over the past 10 years, we've been investigating different geographies around the world, like China, India, Brazil, Europe, to understand what it means to apply these to these geographies and what the opportunity is. For instance, in the EU, we found that by 2030, if we move to a circular economy, the benefits can total about 1.8 trillion euros each year. So it's clear that there is an evidence base. But not only building that evidence base is enough, we're also mobilizing our diverse global network to put these principles into action. We're demonstrating time and time again the value that circular economy brings and the significant benefits that we have to offer. So can you just give an example of the, how the foundation and its network is transforming an industry? Sure, Nick. So if we take the new plastics economy, which is one of our multi-year programs dedicated to its vision of realizing a future where plastic packaging never becomes waste. Over the past four years, they've been mobilizing a network of governments, businesses, designers, and others to mobilize this vision. They launched something called the Global Commitment, which now companies responsible for over 20% of the global plastic packaging material flow has committed to ambitious 2025 targets to eliminate the plastic packaging that we don't need and to ensure that what we do need is reusable, recyclable, and compostable. But of course, plastics is just one part of the broader economy. And we're seeing and triggering this great momentum across the entire economy towards a circular economy. In fact, just this past weekend, you may have seen at home um, the Financial Times, which featured a bold commitment and statement from over 50 leading businesses, governments, philanthropists, and influential individuals, all stating that circular economy, now more than ever before, gives us the tools to build back better to design for resilience from the outset. So Nick, if we apply that thinking to food, can you paint a picture of what circular economy looks like applied to food? Yeah, well, I think the best way is to, to give a few examples because that really brings the circular economy to life and shows that the momentum is, is, is already happening. Things are already happening. So for the way we farm and produce food, it means managing more food in a more regenerative way shifting from a single-minded focus on yield and looking at optimising the system as a whole. Now, how that actually manifests, the practice, it, very, it depends on the context, and we'll be, we'll be digging into that a little bit more on Wednesday. But just to give you some examples, they include agroforestry in Brazil, uh, integrated livestock systems in the US, zero-budget natural farming in India, uh, landscape restoration farming in Ethiopia, and agroecological duck-rice fish systems in Japan. 
All these approaches can deliver more stable yields, reduce reliance on inputs, and also build climate resilience. But if we, if we want to look at sort of organic waste, so companies who have applied circular, upon, uh, circular economy principles to the management of uh, organic waste and byproducts include countless insect uh, production companies such as Entercycle in the UK, Sanergy in Kenya, and Agropotin in South Africa, who are creating insect meal for more uh, sustainable aquaculture uh, uh, processes. But there's also companies like Ecovative, who make packaging and architectural products using agricultural byproducts bound together with fungal mycelium. And then there are innovative bioeconomy material companies like De Cleek from the Netherlands, who aggregate, process and, uh, aggregate and process organic waste streams and feed them into different industries, soap making, breweries, food production. And I think these examples all illustrate the, the, the potential for food, not just to be sort of, you know, move from degrading or to doing less harm, but actually to move the ambition level up. And so food can actually have a positive impact on the society and the environment. And in fact, cities are a really important player in driving this transformation. Yes, very well put, Nick. Mm -hmm. Cities are so critical in all of this. And most people today live in cities and even more so in the future, so much that about 80% of the world's food is expected to be eaten in cities by 2050. So they have this massive demand power. But today, there are these endpoints driving a linear system, right? This damaging, degrading system that we've discussed. But it doesn't need to be that way. Cities can reimagine their role. They can move from being these endpoints of a linear system to catalysts of a positive food system transformation. So how can they do that? They can take action to use this demand power to be sourcing food that's grown in ways that support nature rather than degrading it. They can reconnect with existing food production nearby. And they can eliminate the concept of waste altogether. Now, in order to do that, we need to rewire urban food systems. And we need to redesign our food products, our dishes, our menus with the system in mind. And circular economy principles give us this framework to do that redesign. We found in our Cities and Circular Economy for Food report published last year that if cities around the world achieve these, this vision, achieve these ambitions, they can generate benefits worth $2.7 trillion each year by 2050. So the evidence, again, is very clear of what this opportunity is. And that's what motivated us to launch the Food Initiative one year ago to mobilize this vision. Yeah, and that's what the purpose is of the workshop. Over the next three days, we're really going to bring this circular economy vision to life. We have what we believe is a really sumptuous three-course menu of inspiring sessions that delves more deeply into these deeply, three deeply interconnected areas. So details of the agenda for the workshop can be found on the website. But briefly, later on today, we're going to look at the, the history and theory of urban food systems. And then tomorrow, we're going to look at the role of chefs, food designers and food service companies in the transition. Before moving to Wednesday, uh, where we will be exploring regenerative agriculture in more detail in different contexts. Before rounding off the workshop by looking at how we can use urban, urban organic waste, waste flows for productive purposes. A real sumptuous feast for the mind. And remember, please feel free to share any time. So Emma, how has the foundation been working to mobilise uh, this food initiative, this vision over the last year? Yeah, well, this past year has been all about moving from analysis to action. And we've been building this group of pioneering stakeholders representing companies from across the food system and also across sectors, working with some philanthropic partners as well to show and demonstrate that this vision isn't just a concept, but actually it can be done at scale and to show and demonstrate what the benefits are. We're working with a broader network as well, of course, and stimulating potential game-changing innovation, working with folks like Thought for Food, along with other partners, to host the very first Circular Economy of Food Challenge, which we saw last year had about 3,000 young food innovators around the world coming to the table with their circular food solutions and innovations. 
And I think that's just one signal, one moment that's indicating this incredible momentum that we're seeing, this upwelling of interest in the topic of circular economy and food. And to further accelerate this momentum that we're seeing, one thing that we're doing is developing a digital suite of tools and resources for our broader set of stakeholders. Again, to move from being inspired to actually taking action. And if you at home are tuning in to our contribute sessions over the next couple days, you'll get a sneak peek into some of this content and provide us with some valuable feedback. Okay, so you've described our work at the global level. What, what about the local level? You know, different scales is very important for all of this, yeah? Yes, so exactly right. We need diverse scales of systems when it comes to food to really shape resilient systems. So again, we're working at the global level, but at the local level, we've been looking at regions like China and East Africa, conducting a landscaping study to understand what the opportunity may be and what our work may be. And we're working with a group of 15 cities all around the world to support them in their journey to a circular economy for food. Three of these cities, Sao Paulo, New York, and London, we're working with them especially closely, developing consortia and understanding how to tailor this vision, this universal vision, to these unique contexts and see the benefits. And in just a moment, we'll be joined live with some representatives from each of these cities to hear straight from them. We'll have a great chat with the cities and I'll see you all at the end of this session. Excellent. We're just bringing up our folks on the line. And it's so great to have all of you joining us. Um, before we dive in, I want to give each of you on the line a chance just to introduce yourselves. And Louise, if you're there from Sao Paulo, Perhaps you can kick us off with introductions and say hello, introduce yourself in just a minute or so, and your city. Or perhaps we'll start with Claire. <laughs> Looks like Louise isn't able to join at the moment, or maybe he's having some audio issues. It's, um, it happens to the best of us, I think, <laughs> you know, even when you're, you're most prepared. And I was thinking, you know, when you think you're normally used to doing a conference in front of 100 people, when you're told it's a 1,000, everything starts to get a bit scary. But um, hello, Emma, and uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be part of this event. It's an incredibly exciting event. I've just already found it very stimulating just listening to your introduction this morning. So thank you for allowing us and for me to represent London. So my name's Claire Pritchard. I'm the chair of the Mayor of London's Food Board, and I lead a board of 20 individuals with diverse expertise who advise the Mayor of London, the GLA, on the food matters that affect all Londoners. I became chair in uh, 2018, and I've been on the board for 15 years. But I'm also the CEO of GCA, which is based here in South East London. So you can see my backdrop. You can't tell I'm in South East London. And I've been working on food over here for about 20 years. And we, we actually have a ready meals company which uses only surplus. And fortunately, we had a stock of those meals ready for a holiday meals campaign just as the crisis started. So we've been supporting over 70 frontline food aid organizations delivering tons of surplus and thousands of meals made with surplus, often with the support of restaurants and furloughed chefs. But just listening to Nick's introduction, I just also want to say that EntoCycle started downstairs in our kitchen and it used to take the waste from our fruit and vegetable wholesale business and I remember those first days with those bugs and because Kieran happens to be the son of one of my longer serving colleagues so that's just our introduction thank you Emma <laughs> amazing thanks Claire and love those connection points already um, let's move over we'll hop across the Atlantic over to Kate McKenzie joining us from New York good morning um, it is uh it's a lovely day here in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, my name is Kate McKenzie and I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Food Policy. Um, and over the last several months have been, um, have been a key lead on our Food Czar team that has delivered more than 50 million home delivered meals to, uh, to New Yorkers as a result of the COVID crisis. Um, we have a, a significant um, team um, that's actually uh, 
uh, some of my colleagues who were working very closely, Emma, with us on the on the uh, on the city's initiative back in February and the convening. So we're getting to work together very closely, um, particularly with the Department of Sanitation um, and several colleagues um, also from Department of uh, Transportation and otherwise that really bring together the food supply uh, perspectives as well as food access perspectives as we think about the um, and, and operationalize the COVID response. And I look forward to chatting about that and how our principles of circular economies and our, our priorities around food um, are expressed even more so. Um, so I look forward to that. Thank you. Excellent. And it's always great to see you, even in virtual form. So thank you for joining us. Um, let's see, hopefully, Louise, are you connected and able to provide a brief introduction? Well, let's try again. There Can we go. Me? Hello. <laughs> so I'm Luis Alvaro. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm speaking from Sao Paulo. It's 9.20 here in the morning. Uh, so I'm the International Affairs Secretary here in the city. And we are working very hard with uh, different secretaries, like the Education Secretary, Development Secretary, so that we can rethink the, the, the way we produce and the way we consume here in the city. And it's been a pleasure working with the Elma Factor Foundation so that we can exchange experiences and we can learn faster than we would by ourselves. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for all watching. Excellent. Yeah, and, and we are just so thrilled to have all three of you um, live today for this conversation. Of course, we would have loved to have been in person, but we'll do our best across oceans and, and across continents. Um, so much has changed since a year ago when we initiated our partnership together as partner cities on the food initiative. And so I'd, I'd like to hear from all of you just to hear your latest articulation of your city's food system priorities and also elaborate a bit on if and how these priorities have shifted, especially in light of COVID-19, which we know all of, all of the cities and broader city network around the world are continuing to navigate. So perhaps if we go back to UK and New York to kick us off with um, just an elaboration of the priorities from New York's perspective. Sure, thank you. Um, it's such a great question. And, you know, I actually don't think that our priorities have shifted at all. Um, you know, our, we are focused certainly on increasing food security. That is certainly um, top of mind and most important. Our mayor has, uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio has made it a commitment that no New Yorker will go hungry during the time of, at any time, and in particular during, during COVID. Um, it's particularly challenging given that pre-COVID we had about 1.2 million New Yorkers who experienced food insecurity and um, that number may have in fact doubled um, as a result of some of the economic conditions that, um, that resulted from COVID. Of particular note, the month of April here saw the largest one month increase in um, enrollment in our SNAP program, otherwise um, uh, uh, formerly known as, as food stamps, with an additional 68,000 New Yorkers enrolling for the program, which is the largest increase ever, um, to be honest. Um, so our, our expressions and desires around food security are um, incredibly top of mind. As I mentioned, we're delivering every day more than a million meals in um, either grab and go locations around the city at more than 500 schools, as well as deploying our taxis to deliver meals um, to New Yorkers who are uh, particularly seniors who are um, following guidance and staying, um, staying indoors. Um, we also, you know, our key priority is promoting access and consumption to healthy food. And uh, while it is certainly challenging to, um, to institute um, contracts and, um, and operationalize uh, uh, an operation to the scale that I just described, we are working our hardest and always making improvements to ensure that the health and nutrition of that food um, is the best that it possibly can be. Um, this is going to pose many more um, opportunities to support the development of healthy communities um, and environments. 
Um, you know, unfortunately, there are areas that are more hard, harder hit than others. Um, and we have a very strong racial equity and inclusion task force to address particularly food needs in those areas hardest hit by COVID. And then finally, I would say that our, our, our key priority, which is, of course, a pre-COVID priority, um, very, very front and center now, is around creating strategies that prevent food system um, vulnerabilities um, and advancing food solutions in a very environmentally responsive way. Um, now more than ever, we see the connections, particularly around regionalism and around um, the, the need to support um, our regional food infrastructure um, as a resiliency uh, uh, necessity. So I would just, you know, underscore that our priorities are, are remain, um, remain focused on food security and uh, an environment. And we really want to ensure that we're working with different communities across the city um, to ensure that the responses are, um, are appropriate to their cultures and to their needs. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And some startling figures in there just highlighting the recent shift and in citizen needs that you're responding to. Um, let's move over to Claire with London and hear from you. Yeah, thank you. And I have to say, I mean, a lot of that resonates. There are some strong similarities, so many similarities between New York and London. So yeah, just over a year ago in early 2019, we published the Mayor's London Food Strategy and it's a fully integrated strategy. So when we talked about the partners that Kate and Louis described earlier, uh, earlier uh, transport and business and, and education. It's a very integrated strategy. And it sets out our plan to help all Londoners, as uh, very similar to Kate, access a healthy, affordable and sustainable food, regardless of their background or circumstances. That strategy very much embraces the vision statement for the Food Flagship Initiative in London, a city where everyone enjoys food that is deeply valued, sustainably produced and never wasted. And we really see the cultural and celebratory value of food in, in terms of convening and celebrating this incredible city. So in every sense, that strategy was a recovery strategy to begin with. So even more pertinent now, the strategy recognised the significant role the mayor, the boroughs, London businesses, the public sector and everyone that lives and works in London can play in that recovery. And so we talk about good food at home and that those underlying causes of household food insecurity Kate was talking about, um, referring to good food businesses and particularly the circular food economy, but also good wages, good employers, um, good food in all our public institutions. So all of the public sector procurement and how that supports um, good food production, good food in maternity, giving people the right start, supporting our parents and babies to start with the right food to give them to start with the right relationship with food potentially not sucking from plastic but proper food to begin with and good food for the environment so to highlight some of these significant events of the last year and particularly since the current crisis so in London before Covid we were also dealing with the crisis potential crisis of a no deal Brexit and we've been focused on resilience planning with the uncertainty concerning the UK's exit from the EU. And the food board and colleagues at the GLA and other partners had already anticipated the situation we started to face at the beginning of this crisis. So panic buying, shortages or perceived shortages, increased household poverty and a further polarisation of access to healthy, sustainable, affordable food. So the strategy recognised the importance of household food insecurity and the mayor committed, and this is the first time in the UK, to creating a measurement of household food insecurity. And that exposed even further, this was exposed even further during the crisis, and, and, it's, and inequalities have been exacerbated in this city. So the crisis has brought into stark focus that inequality of access. So many of us um, were aware of this, but I think this crisis, this access to food and how important food is in our, in our world has come to the top of so many minds. And I think people's so typically took it for granted. So I think in a way that's a real silver, well, it is a silver lining. So just on a couple of the other areas, as a response to the crisis, the creation, we had the creation of the London Food Alliance, which has been a great response to redistribution of surplus food, a coordinated response across all of our London boroughs. And what we've resulted in is a new strategic partnership and a greater awareness in every London borough. We've also had 
the creation of the mutual aid network that has developed since the crisis began and has seen an organisation of huge civil movement, often with access or supporting access to good food at their heart. But many are here to stay and already working in areas like creating online allotments, sharing plants with social distancing and online cookery classes. And the Alliance work will contribute to tackling things like food waste. So the mayor committed to a target to reduce food waste by 20% by 2025 and 50% by 2030. And I think the awareness about the value of food has been increased. And I think what, what's been achieved over the last few months will contribute towards that agenda. And in partnership with Capital Growth and Sustain, in early March, we hosted a fringe farming event at the beginning of March, aiming to understand the barriers to a significant step change in urban and peri-urban agriculture. And during this crisis, our partner Sustain have asked boroughs to commit to a huge step change in the way that they are supporting this. And I'm really pleased to hear that boroughs are responsive. So it's great to see political leaders that didn't even consider food to really or go, take, go all the way down the path to thinking about where this food comes from. So I'm very confident and positive about the future here in London. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thanks so much. And yes, lots of parallel themes that are already starting to merge across New York's priorities in London. So let's hear from you, Louise, over in Sao Paulo. Oh, here from Sao Paulo, we bring the perspective of a city from the global south, uh, a city with incomparable, incomparable dimensions and uh, inequalities. Uh, so we have a population of 12 million people. We reach 20 million people when we consider the metropolitan area. Uh, we have 800, uh, 880 farmers markets held weekly throughout the city. Uh, if we're talking about the school system, we, we're talking about 1 million students from kindergarten to 14 years old that are uh, the municipality responsibility. Uh, and every day we, we serve them meals resulting in 2 million and 300 daily meals offered in schools. So we are the largest urban center in the country. We are the national capital for tourism, technology, financial, finances, uh, uh, cultural activities, gastronomy. Uh, and if uh, all of that is still preserved, uh, we still have 12 indigenous tribes uh, within the city boundaries and 33% of our territory is reserved to familiar agriculture. Uh, so I'm proud to say that even with all those numbers, uh, the efforts have not stopped due to the pandemic in terms of uh, circular economy, considering the Food Wave Initiative. Uh, if all, the initiative has just gotten stronger in this last month, as uh, it showed us the power of circular economy in fighting uh, all the inequalities that we have. So uh, we were able to uh, keep the food programs uh, working, uh, we were able to keep the families producing uh, in their agricultural areas and uh, City Hall uh, continued buying the, those food, that food. It was uh, taken to, the, to a project we have called the Food Bank. Uh, and with those initiatives, we were able to attend more than a million, uh, a million uh, families throughout the crisis. So they received what we call, it's, it's like a, a food basket, uh, it's similar to the food stamps that, uh, that was just mentioned. So they were, we were able to attend the families that have their kids in, at home, so they are not being fed in public schools anymore. We were able to attend the families that are in, mo in most need uh, in, their, in the communities and we do have a problem of people living on the streets. We reached 24,000 people living on the streets here in Sao Paulo. It's half of it actually on the streets and the other part in shelters that we provide. Uh, so every day we were able to feed all those people, uh, all, the, all those people. The ones that were sheltered, it was easier because we already uh, feed them every day. But then we have to worry about those that were on, actually on the streets, that they were no longer receiving food from ONGs or from um, people that pass by. So we had to attend everyone. Uh, and we were very pleased to say that together with the private sector and with the civil society, 
Uh, Mayor Bruno Covas was able to create a project called São Paulo, the Solidarity City, uh, where initiatives like the one we have with circular economy, we kept families working, we kept uh, the circular economy and, 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 and food health uh, running on, so everyone was okay. So, Thank you. Out. Thanks so much. That's super helpful from, from all of you to understand and really cementing what we're seeing around the world in cities of, um, you know, a reminder of how essential food is for our lives, for our cultures, for our societies, and for the economy. Um, and also revealing some of the vulnerabilities of these urban food systems in particular. And really, what there's what a theme coming up across all three of your statements for me is, is this need to design for resiliency from the outset. And we hope that Circular Economy can indeed help all of you and your colleagues and in our partnership in particular to be designing more resilient systems so that we're able to rebound from future shocks as well that are on the horizon. Um, earlier in the introduction, we were laying out that initial overview of the vision of a cities and of a circular economy for food for cities and identifying these areas for action. So regenerative food production, um, sourcing from local production where applicable and eliminating the concept of waste. Can, can I'd really be interested if you could just share an example from your city of what a concrete example is. Um, so Kate, if we can go back to you over in New York. Sure, thank you for that. So, um, you know, one of the examples that I'll speak to is work that we are, um, we have underway around uh, good food purchasing. Um, and as, you know, as I mentioned, um, we're also, how that connects to sort of the COVID work is um, thinking through the, um, you know, where we're pulling and where we're able to source through um, products for emergency home delivery. Um, and so awareness about, um, you know, transportation coming into the city, the types of companies that we want to do um, business with. And also, I would say some of the vulnerabilities here around, um, you know, for us, we're really ensuring that right now, we need to make sure that these um, home delivered meals are shelf stable. Um, and so the challenges around that are not being able to, um, to bring in as much uh, uh, fresh and, and, um, and, and to support our regional economies in the way that we'd like to because we have such bountiful um, uh, growers, right? And the fact that they um, largely supply restaurants who just last, just in the next few weeks, we'll start to, to bring back some of the restaurants, but um, there's a tremendous economic ripple from the fact that some of those restaurants, many of those restaurants have not been able to um, to, to supply, um, to, to serve that food. And so of course, then again, from the supply chain of being able to bring in um, that product. So um, the need for these values um, is, is again, just amplified significantly over the course of, um, of setting up new contracts for emergency home delivery. And I think that, again, the, the sort of value system on local economies um, and trying to do as much as we possibly can within our region, um, identifying some of the key challenges there that might have to do with infrastructure, particularly um, refrigeration. And you know, this is not new, but again, it's, it's front and center um, in our mind as we think about um, how do we bring in a uh, product uh, in, in, you know, in, in boxes and, and ways to deliver to um, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers when we have an incredible um, uh, vulnerability around limited refrigeration capacity. So those are examples about you know, things that we can think about as we're re redesigning and, and thinking about the, the blue sky picture for, um, for food system um, opportunities. Um, and then I would also say just to connect to sort of the, the full cycle here, um, looking at, of course, we have the, in this country, the largest um, uh, institutional food provision through our Department of Education, which um, because schools have been shut down for, for such a tremendous amount of time, 
they're actually distributing um, some of the, the product that they've had on hand um, and through a donation to ensure, again, that that product doesn't go to waste. So really keeping in mind, not just the supply of the food, but also the full cycle to ensure that we're really capitalizing on, on all elements of that system. Um, you know, again, I will just say that those core principles of the circular economy, um, I'm so glad that we sort of our last, our last sort of in-person moment back in February um, uh, left us on a note of, of positivity and of, um, of commitment. And now this entire um, situation that we're faced with, it's, it's really looking at it with a, a, again, I think to Claire's point with a very positive note about how we can redesign for the future to be even more resilient. Wonderful, thank you, Kate. And right back over to you, Claire, let's hear from you. Um, yeah, so I was thinking of a bit of a focus on hospitality and food industry. And as Kate says, it's been the hardest hit industry and where some financial uh, support has been put in place is often our food, our food industry has missed out on those. So the food and hospitality sector has been critically hit um, by this crisis. And as the world starts to reopen post-COVID, we think we have a unique opportunity, which is actually time typically missing from the catering and food industry, um, as well as urgent need to support the industry to reopen right and build back better uh, for the benefit of our future generations. So the GLA, there's a number of things that we're doing currently, and, and um, this has given us a new focus um, for this work. So the GLA is currently undertaking a piece of research evaluating the business support available across London. Um, to in order to embed those food strategy principles um, so that the idea of circular economy is part of the business incubation and business training support so it's a comprehensive agenda but also that we now have the adult learning uh, budget now sits with the mayor so that's 300 million pounds a year of devolved budgets mayor so but also a greater opportunity to provide access to training across the business, um, across the city, training and business support, which will help to create more jobs and businesses that contribute to the circular and resilient food system. And this combined with the mayor's role in regeneration, for example, the previous good growth programs that ensure where businesses are incubated and, and are funded with support from the mayor, incubate good food businesses that we hope are part of a circular food economy. I'm also delighted um, to announce the launch today of a new circular economy guide called Food That Doesn't Cost the Earth to help put restaurants and food businesses at the heart of the green recovery. And the guide developed by L Warp's Advanced London team in collaborations with the Sustainable Restaurant Association provides food businesses with practical circular economy measures in seven key areas. So food and drink, energy, transportation, consumables, facilities management, packaging and water to reduce their impact on the environment and give a boost to their profitability. So there is a webinar on the 17th of June at 10 o'clock, which will give food businesses a first taste of the contents of the guide, which co with contributions from the SRA and guest chef speakers. So I hope everyone can tune into that. Thank you. Wonderful. Yes. And, and if you missed it and are looking for it later, we do have a web page on the Foundation's website for the Big Food Workshop, which includes links to the guide that Claire just mentioned. And if you'd like to sign up for that webinar later this week. Thanks so much, Claire. And Louise, let's hear from you. Well, when we're going to talk about one of uh, a practical uh, circular economy practice that we have here, uh, first, we got to address some of the challenges of the city. So I would say that the first big challenge of, um, of Sao Paulo is definitely the city's dimension. Uh, it's size, high level uh, in its high level urbanization. So every policy must be designed in a great scale what is difficult if we don't ha have a strong governance and the involvement of local and diversified stakeholders. Uh, a second challenge I would say is the uh, city's levels of inequalities. So it is common to urban centers of the global south. One of the effects of this inequality is free food insecurity due to difficult access to quality food and high consumption of industrialized food. So even though Sao Paulo comes with a solid, le solid le legislation regarding food security, in a groundbreaking food and nutritional security municipal plan, uh, it has given us the structure and condition to implement an efficient model of food security in the city, enabling many, many other initiatives. But I would highlight the connecting the dots initiative that we have. 
So as I mentioned before, we do have 1 million students from kindergarten to 14 years old that uh, are the municipality responsibility. So in our municipal schools, we serve 2 million and 300 daily meals. And of course, we want to serve them the best we can. Uh, the other, the other uh, dot that we had to connect is that we have 33% we have 33 of our uh, city's territory reserved to familiar agriculture, and we would like to keep them there. Uh, it, it is a protection for the city, it is healthy food being, being produced, uh, and it's important for us to have that kind of a green belt around the city. So what we did is that we, the municipality can buy the food produced organically by these families in their uh, small rural properties. And then we have a logistic system that we deliver those into every, uh, each and every school. And we serve healthier food for our kids, uh, protecting the familiar agriculture, protecting economy, protecting the city with this green belt and having healthier food for our smaller kids in the city. So. This is my favorite one, this is the one that I would like to highlight. Excellent, thank you, Louise. And I, I think that's one of the great threads that was highlighted across multiple cities here is just there are some levers that cities can directly pull, like public procurement, for instance, but then so many of these examples, the success of them hinges on the ability to collaborate and often working across sectors and really working in new ways, which we're being forced more and more to do, especially in this current pandemic and be very agile and creative and in ways that we've perhaps never worked before. Um, just in our final couple minutes, I'd like to give each of you about 20, 30 seconds just to share any final thoughts or perhaps if you have a call to action, I wanna give you a chance to be able to share that with our audience today. Kate, do you mind closing us out or beginning our closeouts? Thank you, thank you so much. It's so um, uh, inspiring to hear from each of my colleagues also. Um, and there's sort of a sense of, of, of camaraderie, certainly in, in experiencing this with, with each of you. Um, I would say that for, you know, what, what keeps me up at night is thinking about how particularly with, our, with the incredible realities of food insecurity right now, just how we are, um, does, how we keep design first and foremost as our mind, in our mind as we're thinking about the best approaches to, to provide for our, our neighbors. And whether that is in um, the, the cultural needs and, um, and desires of food preferences, whether it's in the um, style in which food is received, um, I do think that there's a great element of um, of, of unknown and of, of ingenuity that can come from thinking about how we're re responding, um, you know, in this crisis with innovation. Um, and so I look forward to furthering um, that thinking with certainly the foundation and, and my colleagues um, on this call. Yes, no, we look forward to supporting you and, and the other cities as well on really these innovative new approaches. I think you, very well articulated. Claire, how about you? Any final words? Yeah, um, so I think, and, and the same as the conference today, instead of this being accessed by 100, 150 people, it's being accessed by thousands. And I think this crisis has created a visibility to issues that were very difficult for people to see, a stark visibility. And I think the importance of food, the importance of food as our convener, the importance of where that food comes from, and it's the security and the resilience in which it's produced and the impact it has on our environment. I think they've come into stark focus for people that would never have considered them before. And I think that's a fantastic thing. And I also think when you talked about the linear economy as opposed to the circular economy and the impact that has in terms of economic equality, I think there are a lot of political leaders, uh, certainly local political leaders saying, we need a circle, we don't need a line anymore. And let's do something very let's be innovative and let's be radical because we have growing levels of poverty and insecurity so we're interested in new models so i found that and i've also found that because of the digital access because people really need something to happen quickly and this this demand this interest in radical um 
ideas that more people are accessing that conversation. So mutual aid, for example, a resident, you know, who just decided to change things is now being heard by senior politicians. That is fantastic. Um, so I'm, that's very exciting going forward. But just a, a quick invite, if you are interested in London or have any ideas and want to be part of a circular economic revolution, then we would welcome your involvement. We'd welcome you starting here and coming up with ideas and we're open. Thank you. Amazing. Yes, now more than ever, digital is definitely this incredible, has the potential to be this incredible, powerful tool and accelerator to a new model. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. And Louise, final words from you. Well, here in Sao Paulo, our biggest priority is to guarantee that the whole population has adequate access to quality food, which means creating the means throughout uh, the population, especially the most vulnerable, have proper conditions to feed a decade to. Another priority has been fighting food waste and loss. So through existing policies, we act uh, to collect uh, food from markets, from street markets, uh, from restaurants and redistribute them if they are still adequate to consumption uh, through the food bank initiative. Uh, when they are not adequate for consumption, this food is sent to composting facilities. So uh, we are, the priorities have certainly evolved in, uh, in light of the pandemic, uh, especially in relation to food distribution. Since the beginning of the quarantine uh, in Sao Paulo, we have been working to increase food donations through the food bank and other social programs, especially to families uh, registered in municipal schools. So food security is a priority for us. Uh, as it was just said, we don't need a line anymore. We need a circular economy. Uh, economy has always been circular because uh, everything is limited. So what we got to do is to work it right uh, using the private sector, using the public sector and uh, social uh, initiatives in a way that uh, everyone together uh, will leave no one behind. So the public sector cannot do it alone. The private sector won't act alone. Uh, so with the circular economy, you got to put the whole city to work uh, and everyone is supposed to take care of uh, their neighbor, neighborhood uh, of the city uh, and why not take better care of each other. So that's probably our uh, main focus here. Absolutely. New dynamics, new ways of working. That's what needs to be done. Well, thank you so much. We're incredibly grateful for you taking the time from your afternoons, your mornings. I'm very happy that our tech held up and that we were all able to connect in such a smooth way. So thank you and we look forward to supporting your city's journeys to a circular economy for food. And I'll hand back over to Nick to close out this session and tee us up for what's coming up next. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Emma. That was a really wonderful conversation with some really rich insights on the impacts of COVID-19 on urban food systems from three cities around the world. Now, if you're interested in this topic or you have some expertise you think you could share on this topic, then we've just posted a link to an online publication called Frontiers, which has a dedicated research hub um, for COVID-19 and food system and food systems. So uh, have a look at that. Um, yeah, so we're coming to the end of this first session, but um, I've just been, I was just having a little monitor of some of the platforms and uh, it's just amazing how many people have tuned in uh, from all, all corners of the globe, from Mexico, Singapore, Pakistan, Madagascar, the US, India, Philippines, Bolivia, the Netherlands, Iran, Ecuador, the list just goes on and on. It's really, really really great that you've, um, that, that you've shown such a great interest. Now, the activity on just one of these platforms suggests that we, that it makes it really clear that there's a real appetite for this topic. And a few of you have been asking, you know, so how you can engage more on, the, on, you know, on circular food systems and the circular economy more broadly. So I urge you just to sort of uh, seek out our various uh, social media platforms like LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, and there's pretty active communities uh, on those platforms that you can, you can join in. So if you know people who have not been able to tune in live, um, then please direct them to the Anne MacArthur Foundation Big Food Workshop website. Uh, we'll be posting videos and highlights as the workshop uh, proceeds. So that's it. The next session will be at 4 p.m., which is in about two hours, 4 p.m. UK time, in about two hours time. 
So in that session, we'll be diving into the history and theory of urban food systems, and then looking at how one organisation is applying food system thinking in East Africa. So for now, thanks for tuning in, and thanks for all your contributions. We look forward to welcoming you back very soon.